Chapter 2, Basic Chemistry. So we know that all matter is composed of chemical elements. So what is matter? Think about that for a minute. Matter is anything that has both mass and volume. And when you talk about mass, you are looking at the quantity of matter within an object. You measure the a quantity of matter within an object using a, a balance. And the units of, of mass are grams. Volume is the amount of space that matter occupies. And you know from lab that mass can be measured using a graduated cylinder, or, or, or not mass. Volume can be measured using a graduated cylinder or a beaker, and there you'd have units of measurements in milliliters, or you could use a ruler and take, take the length times the width times the height, which would give you centimeters cubed. So we know that one cubic centimeter, one cc, is equal to one milliliter. So matter is anything that has mass and volume. And for chemical purposes, chemistry, we're going to talk about elements. And there are six basic elements to life. These are the elements that I like to refer to as the chin-ops elements. They would be carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Each of those has their very own atomic symbol. Carbon C, hydrogen H, nitrogen N, oxygen O, phosphorus P, sulfur S. So these are the six elements essential to all living things on planet Earth. An element is a substance that cannot be degraded by chemical means into a substance having different properties. So elements are considered pure substances because they cannot be broken down. Each element has its very own atomic symbol, and you'll see this on the periodic table, that each element has its name and very own symbol for recognition. The smallest particles that retain the properties of an element are its atom, and we'll look at atomic structure in a little bit. So elements cannot be broken down, and each element cannot be broken down in the simpler forms, and each element has their very own atom that gives that atom its unique properties. Those properties can be both physical properties and chemical properties. I would like you to think about, from physical science, the different chemical and physical properties that you know of uh, for, for matter and then how those physical and chemical properties will determine physical changes and chemical changes. And we'll get into some of that later on in the lecture. So if you look, here are elements that make up Earth's crust. It, there are uh, Earth's crust, and then with organisms, we have iron, calcium, potassium, sulfate, phosphorus, silicon, aluminum, magnesium, sodium, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, and hydrogen. So some of those you can see are only found in living things, and some of those are only found in Earth's crust, and then some of them are found in both the Earth's crust and organisms themselves. So if you look on the x-axis, you see the element, and if you look on the y-axis, you can see the percent by weight. So, atomic structure. Atoms contain subatomic particles. You look, need to examine the two basic parts of an atom. There is the nucleus, which is the center of the atom, where almost all the mass is located. If you picture an atom, if you picture the size of a, a, a large pro football stadium, and you were to take a little pin with a little pinhead on it and put that right in the middle of the 50-yard line, that would represent the nucleus of, of the atom, and the radius to which everything else exists would be the entire atom itself. So that would represent the electron shell part. So the nucleus, the center part of the atom, where almost all the mass is located, and then surround that, you, surrounding that, you have the electron shells or orbits. And this is where the electrons are found around the nucleus of that atom. The three subatomic particles found in an atom are the protons, electrons, and neutrons. Protons are positively charged particles found in the nucleus of an atom. Protons have a mass. 
Electrons are negatively charged particles located in the electron cloud or the electron shells. Electrons have so little mass that they are not considered when determining the mass of an atom. And then you have neutrons, which are neutrally charged, which means they have no charge. These are particles that are also found in the nucleus of the atom. The mass of a neutron is equal to that of a proton, which is, a, is about one. So you have one and one for the protons and neutrons. So here you can see it. The uh, proton, electric charge, plus one. Atomic mass is one. Nucleus is the location. The neutron is a charge of zero. Its atomic mass is one. Its location in the atom is the nucleus. And the electron has a charge of negative one. Its atomic mass is zero. And its location is in the electron shells. So here you see an electron cloud model and the electron cloud as you can see the nucleus is composed of protons and neutrons representing the orange spheres for protons and green spheres for neutrons and then outside you have kind of what looks like a shaded dark region close to the nucleus and kind of more dispersed and lighter shaded regions as you come further away from the nucleus. This is an electron cloud model and the electron cloud model is showing or illustrating the probable locations of electrons as they are going around the nucleus of that atom. If you look here, here you could see uh, the same atom. You have the protons in, represented by the orange spheres. You have the neutrons represented by the green spheres. But now you have electron shells being shown. And in those shells, you have the blue spheres that represent electrons. This here is representative of a Bohr model. And a Bohr model is uh, different from the electron cloud model in that it shows electrons found in fixed distances from the nucleus. So an electron cloud model shows the probable location of electrons around a nucleus. And elect uh, the Bohr model shows uh, electrons found in fixed distances from the nucleus. So the atomic model of the carbon atom, because that is the uh, most important element to living things, carbon, we are carbon-based organisms. Uh, we have carbon, if you look at its elemental block on the periodic table, its name is carbon, it has atomic symbol, is capital C, it has an atomic mass of 12, and atomic number of 6. So you have P for protons and for neutrons, and then you in the diagram here, we have the blue spheres represent, representing the electrons, or you could just use the lowercase e for electrons. And that would be, uh, if you look, you have six protons, six neutrons, and six electrons in the carbon atom. How do we determine the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons in the atom? The number of protons, neutrons, and electrons in the atom are determined by the atomic number. The atomic number tells you how many protons and electrons are found in that atom. So the atomic number and, and elements today are arranged in the periodic table by increasing atomic number. So an atomic number of six tells you that the atom has six protons and six or, or six electrons. And you could say it has six electrons only if the atom is not chemically combining with another atom. So atomic number gives you the number of, of protons and the number of electrons in neutral atoms. To figure out the number of neutrons, you need to take the atomic mass and subtract from it the atomic number. So the equation for the number of neutrons equals number of neutrons equals atomic mass minus atomic number. So the number of neutrons in this atom is 6 because you take the atomic mass of 12 minus the atomic number of 6 to give you 6 neutrons. Isotopes of a single element that differ in their number of neutrons. So, for example, you could have the carbon 12 atom, carbon 13 atom, and carbon 14 atom. Uh, carbon 12, 13, and 14 are all different because of their masses. So, you have different numbers of neutrons there. So, you have six neutrons, seven neutrons, and eight neutrons for carbon 12, 13, and 14. So how, does, how do isotopes play an important role in biology? Well, we have radioactive isotopes, and they have many medical uses. At low levels, radioactive isotopes uh, can emit small amounts of radiation 
that can be used as tracers to allow doctors to see inside the body. At high levels, uh, lots of radiation can damage DNA and kill cells. This can also be used to kill pathogens and treat diseases like cancer. So if you think of uh, chemotherapy, you get a radiation treatment that would be high levels of radioactive isotopes. Um, you could also use irradiated, ir irradiation techniques to kill bacteria cells on hamburger meat. Um, irradiation is uh, killing 0H5717, which is the pathogenic form of Escherichia coli, E. coli, which is found on all hamburger meat. So you could treat the hamburger meat to take away those pathogens, foodborne diseases. That is where we'll end this lecture today. Uh, our next topic will be talking about how atoms react with other atoms to form molecules. Have a great day.